Welcome to 2021 Sunstone Symposium Session 175, How to Build a Bridge, an interview with Darren Perry. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there is more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us build a community where all paths are given space to be better understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing to sunstone.org. After the symposium, Sunstone staff will edit, polish, and re-upload all of this year's session videos to the Whova app. It'll take about two weeks for everything to be available, but once it is, every video will be available to watch and rewatch on the Whova app through the end of 2021. Please type any questions into the Whova app to be addressed during the Q&A, or if you're watching in person, we'll open up the audience for questions at the end uh, as time allows. Darren Perry's book on the Bear River Massacre broke new ground around the history of Mormons, Americans, and the Northwestern Shoshone. The, the confluence of each identity places him in an interesting landscape. As a member of the Shoshone Tribal Council and uh, a Mormon, he is a bridge builder between the past and present. Sunstone Executive Director Lindsay Hanson Park will interview Perry about his fascinating life, his conflicting identities, and how he reconciles a complicated past. I'll take a second to introduce you to our speaker before we begin. Darren Perry is the former chairman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Darren serves on the board of directors for the American West Heritage Center, the Utah State Museum Board, the Utah Humanities Board, and PBS Utah. He's the author of The Bear River Massacre, a Shoshone history, and he teaches and lectures all over the country. It is important to him that students hear and understand Native American history from the voice of the American Indian. Darren wants to make sure that the story of the Bear River Massacre and the outcomes of that horrific event are always remembered. It is important that the Shoshone perspective is heard and respected. Darren and his wife, Melody, have blended a family of nine children and 14 grandchildren. Lindsay Hansen Park is the executive director of the Sunstone Education Foundation and host of the Year of Polygamy podcast. She also co-hosts the popular Sunstone Mormon History podcast with Brian Buchanan. I'll now give the floor to our presenters. And I'm the one you complain to for all the audio issues. <laughs> so if we're having problems, uh, we're always looking for donations for better AV. <laughs> um, thank you, Darren, for, for this interview. I've been a fan of yours. Uh, I followed your work. I think that your history that you've been telling and the way that you tell it is is really gifted. And so I'm excited to do this interview today. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm a fan of yours too. So uh, how can you say no to Lindsay? So. <laughs> Plenty of people do. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Matt Page. Okay. No, um, okay, so you have always walked with two feet in separate worlds. It's just kind of... The, the dance that you've done your whole life. And so I want to kind of walk our audience through your background a little bit. So can you tell us about your childhood and growing up and things like that? Yeah, I, I grew up knowing I was indigenous because of a grandmother. My grandmother was Mae Timbimbu Perry. She was uh, an activist. But uh, I was fortunate because my parents both worked. And they dropped me off at her home and it was there that I sat at her feet and learned the culture and the Shoshone way, the old way, the way she learned from her grandparents. And her grandfather was in the massacre as a 12-year-old. So I, I was very fortunate and probably the last generation for our tribe to go through that kind of a deal. But at the end of the day, I'd go home to a, a mom and a dad who was a school teacher. And uh, I think I lived a very privileged life. Uh, different from some of my Native American brothers and sisters that happen to be on reservations. And so I, I'm cognizant of that fact. Uh, it, it's kind of shaped me. But even being mixed, so I'm not all Native, I'm not all Shoshone, uh, I always have identified as indigenous my whole life because of my grandmother. And I heard her tell a historian, well, I think it was Brigham Madsen, came to the home one day to interview her and, and she said you go over and ask my grandchildren who they are and, and they'll tell you they're Indian and so you know I grew up with that it was instilled in me I still didn't really know what it meant as a child growing up in that in that household my dad was a school teacher for a few years and then later on took a job with the state of Utah he was uh, 
the director of Indian Affairs for the state of Utah for 20 years. And he drugged me all over the state to meet different tribal nations and see how they worked. And so that was really beneficial for me too, to, to not only hear my culture from my grandmother, but see other indigenous cultures and how they're navigating, you know, the world that they've been dealt. And, and look, it's changed. <laughs> Every decade it changes uh, to where we are today. So I feel very fortunate in my upbringing uh, because I, I learned really quickly. I lived in a white world, but my grandmother made dang sure that I knew who, where my roots were from and, and taught me that indigenous culture. Can we talk about your Mormon identity for a minute? So you are indigenous in a white settler colonial culture, but also in Mormonism. So now you're navigating indigenous identity, white identity, and Mormon identity. Do they conflict? Do they intersect or interact? It's funny because when I was younger, I mean, ask me what I was, I'm a Lamanite. I mean, the one thing about me, and I can't, I can't, I don't want to apologize for it, but I'm a sixth generation Shoshone Latter-day Saint. Six. And so you take that Mormon culture that's been completely ingrained, and, and so much so, six generations later, how much Shoshone culture could you really have still if, if you're following the doctrine? And so, you know, being raised, I went to church every week. I was expected to go on a mission, and uh, I was taught early on that I'm a Lamanite, a proud Lamanite from the Book of Mormon, and, and everything that, that came with that. And it's really evolved over the years, and I'll tell you a story later about being in the presiding bishop's office less than a year ago and having the Lamanite discussion. And so, uh, but you know, that's who I was. I, I was a Mormon, but I was a Lamanite. I felt I had the best of both worlds. It never conflicted with me, being a young boy. It was just something that I was proud of and, and what I was taught. And uh, yeah, it was never a problem for me to be both. And, and my friends, actually really relished that. They wish we were Native American. We wish we were Indian too. And uh, will you give us an Indian name? And you know, the whole thing. But uh, I never felt conflicted being in both worlds. Uh, not like I do today. So much more today than then. But just growing up as a sixth generation, I remember seeing pictures at my grandmother's house of the early days of Washakie, this Indian community in northern Utah that was established for my people because we did not go to a reservation. The church gave us a farm. Well, they didn't give it to us. We thought they'd given it to us. but uh, And they're perf that first generation, they're performing the Sundance still. And even the second generation, they're still performing the Sundance. But little by little and generation by generation, those things went away. And I don't think they went away because the church said they had to go away. They just went away. Because now you're having children born under the covenant and, and learning that from a young age. And so how much is that indigenous identity really resonating now with now your three and four generations removed? And so um, I was completely removed from the culture, and the only culture I was getting was from a grandmother uh, who really didn't go to church. She was so angry at the church because she felt the church was responsible for the massacre. And so, but for me, it was, I, I had the best of both worlds. I was a Lamanite and, you know, I, I lived a very privileged life, so. So you talk about your grandmother's anger. Was that present as a child? Did you, did you understand it? For what it was at the time or was it just part of her you know a child's view of their grandparent it, it it wasn't evident at the time and and the only thing that was evident to me and now as i look back on it i, I completely understand it uh, at the time i didn't understand it because she just didn't go to church uh, she came to my missionary farewell and she'd go to a baby blessing but she never went to church but she never talked about her anger with the church either 
but I, I've just learned over time now and, and speaking to my dad and his siblings that she always had a really hard time with the church and felt them responsible for it. And so, you know, looking back as a kid, I just thought, I didn't know why she didn't go to church. Uh, but and, and I didn't even question why. It never, I never thought to ask, hey, why don't you go to church like the rest of us do? And, and she never did, but her husband did every week faithfully, but she never did. And, uh, but I, as I look back on it now, I completely understand why. And, and I read her journals now, and I understand why. And so, uh, that, yeah, that was just her cross to bear, and, and she, that's the way she chose to do it. And I honor her for it. Can I ask about your mission for a minute? Since yeah, you yeah. Up. So where did you serve? I served in uh, Liverpool, England for almost the whole time. Got called to England. So I want to talk about that a, a little bit. So you're identifying as a Lamanite, and you're teaching the Book of Mormon. Did, did that identity you know, come into play as a missionary? Yes, because I made it come into play. But the thing is, in Liverpool, you're right next to Wells. My last name, Par Perry, is P-A-R-R-Y. It's Welch. So the, the white side of me is Welch. And I, there wasn't one day that went by that an old Englishman had, oh, Parry, good Welsh lad, you know, and remind me of those roots that I wanted to squash. I, no, I... I I might be a little Welch, but I am a Shoshone Indian. And then that would open up a whole new another discussion. And it's funny, I have a, a missionary companion. His name's Richard Osler, but he he's, does a lot of good things with our LGBTQ communities here in Utah. We were companions for like eight months and uh, served with him, and we had the best time. And uh, ask him what I was. I was only Shoshone. I wasn't anything else. So... I tried to, to relay that with every every convert I met, and I actually promoted the the I'm a Lamanite from the Book of Mormon. These are my people. Yeah, I wondered. <laughs> I wondered about that, and I didn't know about Richard. That's so fun. Uh, Papa Osler, if you haven't, is it? Follow him on social media on What's Twitter. What's his podcast called? I forget that. Listen, learn, and love. Listen, I learn, think and love. That's he's right. got a great perspective on things, though. So. Okay, so we're talking about this history is in your family, this massacre history that's sort of behind the surface of your grandmother's life, but not really interacting with your life. So before we talk about the history of the massacre, can you tell us about how you start to come upon the history when it starts to rise up in, in your life? You know, you know I'd, I'd heard the history. I've heard all the stories. I'd sit at her feet and hear how the coyote stole fire or how the the porcupine became greedy. And all of these indigenous stories were meant to uh, teach a, a value, an indigenous value, which is a value to all of us, really. But uh, it, it's just, so I knew my role. Even as a young child, that culture was so important to me. But if you know anything about indigenous culture, there's almost a hierarchy. Uh, to who can disseminate the knowledge. And, and I knew that I just needed to keep learning and keep, keep doing everything I could, and one day it would be my turn. Uh, most of the wisdom and most of the teaching is done by elders, tribal elders. And so uh, for me to try to do, you know, step out on the stage as a younger person, or even as a young adult or a young married man uh, raising children, uh, I always knew in the back of my mind that was a role that wasn't mine yet. And so um, I did everything I could to support and do everything I could for our people, knowing in the back of my mind, though, uh, that, that it wasn't my time. And so, but I wanted to be prepared when it was my time. And so, you know, learning as much as you can from your elders and, and making those stories part of you and part of who you are, uh, it really didn't come to fruition for me. I think, you know, the last five years for me really intensely has been uh, me stepping out and, and being a voice for my people and, and a voice uh, to make our lives better. You know, the, the hard thing for indigenous people, 
uh, we're trying so hard to retain that culture in a modern world. And, and I look at my friend Sean Sherman. I don't know if you follow him, but he wrote a book called The Sioux Chef. He's a Lakota Sioux. Uh, he just opened a restaurant in Minneapolis. He's taken indigenous foods, these old indigenous foods of the Sioux, but he's using modern techniques to create this cuisine. And so that's who Native American people are, indigenous people are, and the hand we've been dealt. How do we retain this perfect culture, this old culture, but, but use modern techniques to navigate the world that, that we live in today? Because you have to, to be successful. And in, in my, to me, the most successful Native Americans are those who can best balance culture and change. We have to be resilient. We have to be able to adapt to our surroundings. And we have, and that's why we're still here. Thomas said before, not only are these, these Native American people, they lived 100 years ago, but they're still here today. And so how do we navigate that world? Because it's conflicting. And so... Uh, was there a sense that, of loss or that you were losing it as a child? Did you understand that the culture was being lost? I didn't understand it as a child that it was being lost, but I certainly understand it today. And when, uh, when did that occur for you? When did you start to notice? Uh, probably 10 or so years ago. I really realized that as I looked at our... I, I ran for tribal council, and you get on the council, and then you see the programs that your tribal you have, and and then you look at it and you say, well, my goodness, we only have 12 full speakers left in the Northwestern Band, and they're all over 65. And so now, what do you do as a as a leader, as an elected leader by my people? So those issues started coming about 10 or 15 years ago that, you know, I always talk about it being a blessing that we were not moved to a reservation. And while it was a blessing in so many respects, we don't have the drug abuse and alcoholism, unemployment, but what we lose at a huge rate is the culture and the language. And, but that's really the identity of Native American people and so when you're losing that at such a rapid rate, uh, you know, figuring that out 10 years ago, and now I'm working tirelessly every day to change that, but it's like sticking your finger in a hole in a dam. Uh, it's just very, very difficult in, in the world that we live in today to try to retain that culture without being on a reservation where we're together, we go to school together, we date each other. I mean, I, I said to somebody in the restroom a minute ago that asked me about the culture and how our tribe's doing, I said, well, we're one or two generations away from being extinct. And, and, and he goes, why is that? And I said, well, if we lived on a reservation, we'd probably date another Native American girl. But we've assimilated into the culture, and so we don't date other Native American. We just don't. And so we're marrying... Uh, others and so you know the government made us set to be Shoshone you have to be a blood quantum of a certain that's a government thing it's not a native thing and so you know we had to set our, our limit at one eighth which is really pretty low to be on our tribal roles but but most of our tribal members are one fourth and so do the math in, in one or two generations you don't have any more Shoshone left, uh, at least Northwestern band. And there's things we can do to change that. We can change the blood quantum, but uh, it just, the government still is making it hard for us to survive. And, and so me as an indigenous leader today, it's just really important that that culture and, and that mindset, uh, we don't lose it. But, but how do we take that into a modern world and use it to our advantage? The Inuit, some of those Inuit people decided to, well, we're going to take modern technology, the gun, now to hunt walrus. We'll use the gun, but we don't want to use the snowmobile. We'll use dogs still to hunt. That's their way of saying, 
stepping one toe into the hot water of, of modern, being modern. And so they're willing to, to take one piece of it and use it, but they're not willing to use a snowmobile. They still want to retain the way their people had done it for thousands of years. And I get that. I get that. Even though a snowmobile would be a lot easier in many respects, they still don't want to lose that identity. But we have the same thing today. So you talk about this, re this idea of the government's interaction with your tribe and uh, reservations. Maybe, can you give us a brief history of the Shoshone, Northwestern Band Shoshone relationship with the government and sort of where it is now? Yeah, we, I mean, we were, uh, and I won't talk about the massacre right this second, but uh, we were not a federally recognized tribe until 1980. And so, uh, and there's many tribes today that are still not federally recognized. And, you know, the fact that the government has to tell you that you're federally recognized to be a, to be an indigenous person. And if you're not, you're not. I mean, give me a break. It, it's the weirdest thing to me that you know we have to prove our Indianness first of all, and uh, and the government's going to tell us that that that's the case. But you know we were recognized as federal tribe in 1980. Part of that uh, being recognized, you have to have a you have to have land, which we did not. And even though the town of Washakie that was established as this Indian farm that we thought we owned. Uh, it was thousands of acres uh, the church took back from us in 1960. And so we were landless again. And then to be federally recognized, we petitioned the church to give us some of Washakie back. And they quick deeded 184 acres, which was our cemetery where Sagwich and others are buried. And so because of the church quick deeding us that land, we were able to get federal recognition from the government. So now we're a sovereign nation within a state that resides within a nation. So talk about complicated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Unravel I'm that one. And so self-identity, self-determination, I mean, it, it only goes so far. It, those are all great words, but it's still at the end of the day, you know, we had to put our land in trust. Well, who puts, you know, the government controls our land. And so when you put it, we don't own it, it's in trust. And the government can pull the string at any time. And so it's a complicated relationship. The state of Utah has been really good, I think, with the indigenous people. Uh, the governor today, Spencer Cox, has been really good to work with. He listens, uh, even though I, I tell him all the time he doesn't need to. Uh, tribes come under federal jurisdiction in almost every case, and so the fact that they'll sit down and listen to us and try to help in in ways is, is really good. So I think our relationship with the government is good. I found out a long time ago that it's, it's just treating people decent and going to the table and not being angry. I have a lot of na angry Native American friends, a lot. Then they'll hit you over the head with the history every chance they get. And, and my one friend who's a Ute, I, I told Sean, I said, Sean, you speak so loudly that people can't hear you. And, and it's not that my way is the best way. There's room for all of us. There's room for activism. There's room for, but my way has gotten us a seat at the table just because they know that I'm there to work with them and work together and see what we can do together to make the world a better place. And so, um, it's worked for me and, and the way we navigate this world we're in. And so I, I just think it works better. So, One of the things that I've heard from folks in spaces like this, like Moroni Benali, for example, is because you have a Mormon identity that intersects with, you know, federal tension, but also federal patriotism and all of these things, and then this idea of anger within, within being colonized, a strategy for surviving that, some, you know, assimilate and some do not. And so then it puts you at odds with even your own people. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so you're navigating all of that. Um, I want to, I want to ask for a minute, 
if you if you feel driven by injustice, if there's a sense of injustice that, that fuels your work. Before we started this, I said, the older I get, most of us get more conservative probably the older we get. I'm the opposite. I'm, I'm way more left than I've ever been. And so, and I'm getting worse every day. I mean, every day. Driving down here, I went one degree more. And so, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I find myself just, I don't know, I'm not getting angry or I'm getting uh, less patient with, with government, with church, and, and, and mostly with church lately. I, I just, and look, the church has been really good to us. They were our first donor with our interpretive center we're building at our massacre site. I've had to work closely with with the presiding bishop. He's a good friend of mine, and I love him dearly. But I'll tell you of an experience I had that I lost my patience. Uh, I had a meeting at the, I call it the great and, great and spacious building, the church office building. We're on the 10th floor in his boardroom with uh, like 20 people, attorneys and everybody else. We're, and the presiding bishop said, tell everybody in the Herod's room uh, the ma about the massacre. Because he had me over for dinner, and I spent three hours talking about the massacre. But he said, take a few minutes and talk about the massacre. And I did. And I didn't know, because I didn't know him at the time, but the guy next to me was Elder Snow. He was a 70 church historian, the main historian. And I start talking about the saint's role in the massacre. And uh, he got really angry in this meeting and said, we did not massacre one person. And I said, you may have not fired a shot. And I didn't know who he was. I, he had a suit. And I said, you, you didn't, the saints didn't fire a shot, but you were absolutely the cause. And I was pounding my finger in that boardroom table. And, and I just thought. I wish mm -hmm. I was there. I just thought, come on. I mean, and. You know, from that point on, I'm just I, I'm just losing patience with how fast we're moving to to reconcile the past. I don't know. Uh, I I don't know how else to say it. I, While still living in the womb. Yeah, of it. yeah, yeah. Still living in the moment of it. So uh, I don't know. We'll see. Well, let me switch gears for just a minute. And for those who have never heard of the Bear River Massacre, can you give us a brief history? So I actually left the book that I was going to bring. We have <laughs> his book out in the hall that he is willing to sign. But Bear River Massacre, do you think do you have a copy? Yeah, I got a copy. You can show I would minute. recommend everyone purchase a copy. It's very important history. So you can see that we've got a lot of folks watching right now. So go and buy this. Where's the best place to support you? You can get it from me and follow me on any of my social medias, or you can get it from Amazon. Uh, so he's written a so. whole book about this, but I want you to kind of give us an overview for folks who don't know anything about it. And you know, the funny thing is, I spoke in Logan the other day, and an elderly woman, probably 85 or 90, came up to me, and she said, I don't know anything about the massacre, and I've grown up here, and my ancestors were the first ones here, but we were told never to talk about it. And I just thought, huh, that's interesting. You're never supposed to talk about it. And so it's kind of the dirty little secret, I think. But, you know, Brigham Young, they come. They're running out of useful land. More saints keep coming. And, and they finally send a, a group to Cache Valley, where our people lived and wintered. And so, you know, uh, when Peter Mon settled in Cache Valley in 1855, that was kind of the death knell for the Shoshones. We were hunters and gatherers, and uh, we traveled in a cyclical pattern. We needed the wild grasses and seeds and berries and fish and game. And the saints were uh, hunting the same deer, elk, buffalo that we needed. Their cattle were trampling the grasses and eating the grasses and instead of wide open fields and spaces we now have fences and so uh, at the end of the day it just the depth the loss of resources really starved our people out and i tell people i think we have three options beg for food starve or steal and i think we did all three in fact but my grandmother 
I laugh every time I talk about it. She said, Darren, we never stole anything. We were always collecting rent. <laughs> and so I, I liked her attitude towards it, but there were depredations, I'm sure. On you got, both sides. On both sides. And you, you got to understand the California and Oregon Trail cut right through that land. And then they built a, a road from Salt Lake to the California and Oregon Trail so that they could jump off there, the immigrants, to, to get supplies. And so you have this interaction, close interaction, and now the Shoshones are out of food sources. And uh, the saints in Cache Valley started writing letters to Brigham Young saying, we've got an Indian problem up here. And so those letters found their way to a federal judge who issued arrest warrants for the Chief Sagwich, Bear Hunter, Pocatello. And uh, they made their way up to Camp Douglas in, uh, on the hill uh, the army was there to keep an eye on the Mormons. That was their, you know, they signed up in California to fight in the Civil War. They were warriors. They wanted to go fight. Halfway across Nevada, they get new orders. The Mormons are going to succeed from the Union. Go keep an eye on the Mormons. And uh, so they did. They found themselves in Salt Lake with nothing to do. The Mormons are not causing a lot of trouble. And so when they hear there's Indian trouble, just... 80 miles north, it was an easy thing for the Army to decide that they wanted to, we could take care of this and we could fight. In fact, uh, Connor, Patrick Connor, the commander, said before he left Salt Lake, he said, uh, I'll go north, but I'm not going to deprive my men a little fun of Indian killing. And it was his intention to kill every man, woman, and chi child he could find. And so on the morning of January 29th in 1863, the army uh, arrived at, at Bo Ogai, or what we call the Bear River. And after four hours, uh, we believe that uh, the army massacred more than 450 men, women, and children. If that's true, it would be probably one of the largest massacres of Native Americans, especially in the West, especially west of the Mississippi, uh, in the in this country's history. And so, uh, but nobody knows about it. And so I've been working hard every day to try to change that, and try to just bring awareness to the story. My grandmother always told me, Darren, no one has ever wanted to hear our story before. One day you're going to have to make them listen. And you know what, I've not had to make them listen. Uh, I think we're in a time and place in the world today that people want to know. They want to know about the massacre. They want to know about these things. and. They want to know, uh, hopefully because uh, by learning about the past, we can, we can do better. And so, you know, the massacre uh, was, was horrific. And so uh, two pioneer brothers went, Brigham Young sent them two, one day later to look for survivors, but he also wanted a head count. One of those pioneers counted 461 dead and one counted 489. And so we know it was north of 450. Uh, Connor, in his field report, only said there were 235 killed. But in the parentheses, he put bucks. He only counted the men. So uh, people always question me on the number. You know, how it was only 235. Only 235. You know, we have Sand Creek that has a national monument at it, and it was... 125 Arapaho or so and, and, but it's never about the count to me you know any loss of life is is uh, any massacre any loss of life is horrific but when you have something on this scale that I think has been not talked about because they were told not to talk about it I, I that's why I think Elder Snow <laughs> there's some culpability there and, and I just was calling him out on it and so, and I think they recognize it. I, I just feel like the church, though, has a hard time apologizing for things and, and making things right and moving forward. And, but man, that's part of reconciliation is, is talking about it and, and looking at it and seeing is it a problem and then working together to make it better. And so uh, that's why I get frustrated a little bit with it. But the massacre is something that uh, 
uh, I want people to know, uh, as horrific as it was, it doesn't define us. Um, we're still here. The descendants are still here. And uh, I just think the hard work of our people today should define us. And, and uh, how can we take a tragedy like this? Because every one of us is going to go through a tragedy in our life. But how do we respond to those events? Because I think how we respond and move forward determines more of our character than anything else. And so that's really, if I had one message in my whole life, it's that. Yeah, a horrible thing happened, and we need to honor them and, and, and respect them. But we also need, because of them and their story, we need to move forward and tell their story. Uh, I always, my grandmother would take me to the site all the time and she'd say, if you're here at just the right time in the evening, you can hear the cries of the little ones crying for their mothers. There's a feeling there at the site. And so uh, to honor them and their legacy, it's just important that for me to tell their story and move forward in a way that brings people together, so. So you talk about waiting for your time to tell the story and I looks like your time came with first publishing this not first but as part of that publishing this book and uh, passing on this legacy and sort of it's was it like a reconciliation project within yourself to do something like this yes it was for me but you know my grandmother wanted to write a book her whole life uh, and she had an old typewriter and I've got tons of journals of hers that she typed. I can't even imagine how long it took her to type that stuff out. But she always wanted to write this book about our history and our culture, and she never did. She got Parkinson's disease, and uh, it just really cut short all of her goals. And so it was just important for me to honor her legacy and to finish a project that she started. And so, you know, that was such a big deal for me, more so than me even wanting to do it is to make sure that all of her work that she'd worked her whole life uh, with, uh, people could see it. And people could see it through my eyes now. And so, but my eyes are her eyes. And so, uh, I, hopefully she's happy. So I'm currently researching Juanita Brooks for a forthcoming biography about her. And her story is about Juanita discovering her grandfather's complicity in the Mountain Meadows Massacre, which, just as a reminder for everyone out there, especially ex-Mormons, when they say it's the greatest, ma it's the biggest massacre in history, uh, no, it's not. As, as we've learned today, it's, it's probably the biggest massacre of white people that we know of, but it's certainly not the biggest massacre. So Juanita Brooks discovers this history, and she publishes about it as well, and she receives a lot of pushback. To me, there are so many similarities to her story yeah. and you. Uh, you're doing the same thing. Have you received pushback from our community? Not to my face. And, and, so, and, and let me just tell you something that happened the other day that really shocked me. You know, I tell people, we're, we're trying to build this interpretive center at the massacre site, and I'm raising money to do it, and I'm speaking all over the, everywhere, and I think I have a great relationship with the people that live in Preston, Idaho, in this Franklin County. I think I do. So I've never heard any negative comments with what we're trying to do there. But I, there's a grad student that's been working for me this summer uh, with a but he's done his dissertation and he's, his work was working with locals to, to find out, uh, he was interviewing locals about our project, how they felt about it, and, and other things. And, and the funny thing is, he's, he came to me the other day and he said, so how do you think, you know, you got a good relationship here? And I said, yeah, great. I never heard one negative thing in five years. And he said, well, I can't tell you how many times people have told me in this interview process that, you know, Darren just doesn't understand, and these are farmers, right, around the massacre site, Darren just doesn't get it because he's an outsider. And, and so I just thought, what? I'm, I'm an outsider? 
And so these farmers that may have been there a generation or two or whatever, uh, consider the Shoshones who bought our land back in 2018. We just don't understand the local culture because we're outsiders. And it's just, it brought me back down to reality though of, you know, I, I still have some work to do and maybe all the amount of work in the world is not going to get there with some of these guys for sure. But uh, yeah, it was a weird thing for me to hear that, that, that I was considered that because I always thought, man, I have, I've got buy-in from everybody and I really don't have buy-in from everybody. There's still some, some long-term holdouts and long-term discriminatory thinking that's still going on in those communities. Well, that and I see the Trump flags, and so you know, I <laughs> figured that out real quick too. But uh, yeah, it's just been, it was an eye-opener for me to, to see that pushback. And it wasn't blatant in your face pushback, but it was, you know, behind the scenes pushback, and, and I, I, I wasn't expecting that. So we talk a lot about in, in the Sunstone space and this sort of, you know, larger Mormon space about anger a lot. Anger comes up at the church, anger comes up at a lot of people's experiences, and I think in our culture anger is very taboo. We don't, we don't want it, but, you know, I've been reading a lot in my own journey about anger. Maya Angelou says, anger is good, it burns out the bitterness, right? How, how do you deal with, obviously, the natural feelings of, of anger and frustration and not being heard and sort of the ignorance that you're confronted with? How do you view <laughs> anger? What role does it play in this journey? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, it wasn't on our list, I'm sorry. No, no, and that's okay because uh, most people that know me probably in the last five years think I've never seen him angry at all, ever, about anything. But uh, there's times I go home to my wife, my poor wife. I mean, <laughs> I put her on a plane to Florida today, but my poor wife, because I'll go home because it's a safe place for me to uh, vent mm -hmm. that anger. And, and I try not to do it outwardly, you know, in a setting that would probably call for it. Because I just feel like I don't want to damage any of the, the, the things I've been working on to try to accomplish. But I have friends that call me out on that and say, well, you're a sellout then. You, you, you need to be angry. Uh, we wish you would be more forceful and, and raise a voice of anger or protest in some of these settings. Because it would help us. It would help our cause. And so I'm very cognizant of that fact that uh, the way I do things maybe isn't necessarily the best way all the time. And, and being angry and, and getting your point across in that type of way uh, is probably uh, very therapeutic. <laughs> so maybe one of these days you might be seeming angry on TV. But uh, I don't know. I, I have a safe place at home that I can go home and really vent and talk. And she'll just listen. Bless her heart, she'll just listen to me and and uh, every now and then ask a question about it and usually I'll sleep on it and the next day I'm, I'm back to where I'm not angry anymore and I can process it. But uh, I think I would be probably be better off if I expressed a little bit more of anger, frustration, some of those things to to really support some of my brothers and sisters are going through hard things. Oh. Yeah, I, th I think anger can be sacred. Uh, it, it can burn out bitterness, but it can also burn a bridge. And I found in making progress, there are two kinds of work. There are burning bridges <laughs> and building bridges. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of your work is building bridges. So why don't we talk about that? Because nobody does it better. You've, you've managed to build so many bridges. I, I don't even think that people recognize publicly, just on a personal level and a political level. So. Let's talk about the, the bridge building for just a moment. Well, it's funny. The other day, I, Mike Maurer, who used to work for the governor, the last governor, he was his chief of staff, he posted a picture of the, at the state capitol of them flying the new flag. 
or the 125 year anniversary flag. And it was over the Indian, the statue that they have there. And it was just, and I just posted on Twitter. I'm way more vocal on Twitter. If you want to, <laughs> I'm way more controversial on Twitter. Let me say that. But I just quoted, oh, how, how ironic or something, you know, this 125 anniversary flag is right over a Native American uh, sculpture. And, and, a lawmaker, one of the House of Representative guys, sent me a private message and go, said something like, uh, you know better than that. And I thought, you know what? My building bridges has come at a cost sometimes to me, the way I've done it. And, and I'm not going to apologize for it because I think I've gotten so much more done and continue to do. But I felt like it, that was a shot at me for that I can never have a voice. I can never, you know, call somebody out on something because I, I've always tried to build these bridges of understanding uh, between different groups that may not certainly have differences of opinion. But he called me out on it like you you shouldn't ever feel frustrated or have a voice. And I sent him a private message back and said, look, uh, you know, I, I called him out on how he called me out. And I said, uh, it, it, it's, it's not right. And so uh, I have to walk a fine line here between building bridges and, and don't, and I said to him, don't misinterpret me building bridges as me being passive and me never going to stand up for what I think is an injustice. And I said, to me, that flag, you're honoring this culture and you're honoring Pioneer Day, and that's great. It's an LDS holiday with an LDS narrative, and if you keep that in mind, we're good. But that's all it is. And so, you know, commemorating this 125th anniversary of our flag, but it's over this Native American. I said that was completely symbolic to me. I said don't don't take my bridge building and my quietness or my the way I conduct business as a sign of weakness, and, and that I should never have an opinion other than the way you've always seen me because I have an opinion. And I said uh, I have to walk a fine line sometimes, and and it's not easy. And so. Yeah, I don't know. I think people don't like it when truth is spoken, especially a truth that they've you know been trying to hide. For my anecdotal experience with with this site is, we would have a family reunion up on the uh, along the Bear River every year, mm -hmm. and we were told something bad happened, but not what it was. So we just thought yeah. it was haunted, you know, as kids. And <laughs> now you're speaking up, and you're and you're speaking out, and you're you know bringing this history to light. And what I've noticed just from within my own community is people are starting to listen and wake up to this. Mm -hmm. And you're a voice for people who are straddling these different identities. What would you say to, to folks, especially indigenous Mormons, who really are often forced to pick sides? And, and how, how, what advice would you give to navigate? My advice is probably changing in the last couple of years. I, I, my advice would be to... Uh, Hold on to that culture. Hold on to that cultural identity. Don't let the church or anyone else dictate to you uh, how you should be or how white you should be or how delightsome you should be. Embrace that cultural identity at all costs, at all costs. And so, uh, because if you believe in the Book of Mormon, and look, whether you believe it or not, and I love the handsome lake you talked about, and I, I, I did a social media post about Handsome Lake and, and Red Jacket, his cousin, who would have been in New York with Joseph Smith at 16 years old. And there's no way Joseph Smith didn't go hear him speak. No way. It happened. And so uh, I, 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 the advice I'd give to my other brothers and sisters is you hang on to that Native American identity because you know what? Uh, over the years, I've come to realize that I think our Creator cares less about whether we're Mormon, Catholic, 
any other denomination, and I think he cares more about who we are. And as an indigenous people, I think their values and things that they represent and how they've represented themselves over time uh, speaks volumes and speaks for itself. And so, uh, yeah, I, I just, and, and even if you believe in the Book of Mormon and the promises that were made to the Lamanites in the Book of Mormon are incredible. They're, they're a covenant people, more so than you white guys. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that, I just shouldn't have said it that way, but uh, there's a role to play in the last days, if we're in the last days, there's a role to play, and it's a prominent role. And, and you know, I took D. Todd Christofferson on a tour of the massacre site a few weeks ago with his brothers, and I talked to him about that. I said, I talked to the Native American people being a covenant people. And I didn't say Lamanites, I just said Native American people. Because I've met with Hopi tribal elders and Pueblo tribal elders who uh, are talking about sacred things that they have known for thousands of years. These are indigenous people that have this knowledge from the creator and you don't have to be baptized a Mormon to have that knowledge and to have that uh, connection with the, with the creator. And I see those indigenous communities that are thriving and are going to thrive even more so in the future. And so I would tell them, give all the advice, retain that Native American culture and identity at all costs. Thank you for that. Um, what advice would you give to white Mormons and Mormon historians who are just waking up to this history? How, how can they honor this history and the past and, you know, sort of, I think, I think that there's this idea that this defensiveness that we don't have to pay for the the price that our ancestors did and yet we're still benefiting from you know sure. what they benefited from I know I think the biggest piece of advice I could give people is to listen listen to native american voices uh, you know when when Winston Churchill said that uh, history is only written by the victors. That it perfectly under, makes it sense why Native American histories are never written or heard from our perspective. And so uh, my friends are all academics. They're all <laughs> you guys. They're all PhDs in history and they're all religious studies. And, and so just listen to that voice. Listen to that Native American voice. And in that way... Uh, that's how you honor us and, and write about it. I, when that book came out, I, I spoke at a conference and a, a professor, she was a woman, she was white, she came up to me and said, well, did you use primary sources on your book? And I just, that was an angry moment that I kept to myself. And I just said, absolutely I did. From my third great grandfather, Chief Sagwich, from my grandmother, Mae Timbimbu, all these oral histories that have been taught to me over my lifetime. Yes, they're absolutely a primary source. <laughs> and she just turned and walked away. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's so much to learn in, in, in indigenous communities, all indigenous communities from South America to, you know, to North America uh, and all around the world. I think there's such a wealth of knowledge and and you watch. I think as we go on, you know, you don't think climate change is real. Just wait a, another year or two when we have zero water. And then look back at the way Native Americans honored the land and honored our responsibility and our stewardship with the environment. And and look at those roles and how they played out. And and I think there's going to be a shift. I think I think Native American wisdom. I think some of that stuff is going to come to the forefront here soon, sooner rather than later. But scholars and, and can really help that cause along by really engaging with and helping Native communities come up with stuff and write about themselves. 
I appreciate that you said that. It was uh, Dr. Elise Boxer at Sunstone, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. that, that woke me up to the idea that as historians, we only care about the written word, documentary history, not oral history. And the, really the only difference between that is, and you know, your grandmother's history and mine is that mine wrote it down earlier than mm -hmm. yours did. Mm -hmm. And so we count it as a primary source. So it, I appreciate you bringing that up and, and how even the history and the way we tell it is prejudiced to the victor, as, as you would say. But isn't, isn't primary sources, though, skewed? I mean, the person that wrote that down had biases they lived a life so they the way they wrote it down is slanted or tilted to how they were raised mm -hmm. and so you if how much you know how much do you put into just because it's a primary source i mean brigham young was racist and and so anything he wrote, you just got to know that all of his policies had to do with certain ways he believed. And so a primary source doesn't make it true. It makes it true from that guy's perspective, and that's all. And so it's not more valuable than anybody else's, to me. So. Well, along that note, before we get to the audience questions, Let's talk about how your, you know, the stories that you're telling, not just here, but your projects, because you really are telling it from a perspective that I don't think is being told. I, I think it's important that you encourage scholars to write it, and there's so many great scholars that are, who are doing it, but it's also important for indigenous scholars to, mm -hmm. to write. So how can we support you, your work, the work of other indigenous scholars? Buy, buy their stuff. <laughs> so I, I don't know how else, but uh, invite them to speak. You know, Utah has eight indigenous tribes, and there's a wealth of knowledge, even in a tribal elder. I mean, you want to hear something wonderful, sit down with a tribal elder for an hour and just listen. Don't do anything else other than listen. And so just in, in those ways, and uh, more speakers, more uh, giving them opportunities to tell their stories, and more interviews and things like that, I think it will go a long way. So, <clears throat> I apologize, my phone died, so I don't get my Hoover app here. <laughs> but we do have a, one more question for you from the audience. Uh, they wanna know about your grandmother and her role and story that she asked. Uh, so she, she played a big role in your history um, what role do Shoshone women play in your community in general? Well, we're a matriarchal society, so our women were everything. But I think my grandmother, and the a story I just came up with the other day is, is in 1932, the Daughters of Utah Pioneers put up a monument at the Bear River Massacre site. And it was meant to tell the story of what happened. And I've got a picture of that event in 32. On the front of the stage is 10 Shoshone men. I see my great-grandfather and my great-great-grandfather. And they're in full regalia. They're smiling. They're happy. There's a sheet over the monument. Nobody's seen the plaque. You don't know what it's going to say. And then they unveil this plaque that talks about the Indian women and children combatants and really talks about the brave soldiers and the pioneer women who took care of them. Lost out of the whole narrative is the Shoshones that died. But guess who else was in the audience that day? A 13-year-old girl named Mae Timbimbu. And I know, I don't know for sure, but I, am, I bet my life on it that that day she became an activist. When she read that plaque and she said, oh no, this is not how this is going to be told. This is not how this is going to be remembered. I think at that day and time, she became the person she was going to be the rest of her life. And uh, she had such a huge influence on me. I just do it a little differently than she did. And I think the time is right now that the story can go forth. But it wouldn't have gone forth had it not been for her. She gets all the credit for this, for sure. Well, I, I'm going to ask questions from this audience, and for those who are watching at home, I'm sorry, I've been running a conference on my phone today, so it's it's dead, but I'll have, I'll make sure Darren checks in and check, answers your questions on the app. 
But does anyone have questions here? Thank you so much. The Book of Mormon talks about uh, a Lamanite skin color being influenced by the righteousness uh, uh -huh. that was supported by prophet statements through the years. Can you comment on that again? It's funny you mentioned that because I just read a couple of conference talks by Spencer W. Kimball in like 1960 that talked about the Indian placement program and how the kids that went to it actually are becoming lighter shaded than their brothers and sisters that stayed home. And I'm like, what? I mean... Yeah, and, and so I just, I, I knew it was out there. I had never read the talk, though. And it just was, uh, yeah, it's a little bit troublesome. And, and, you know, even they're taking things out of the book, they take out the whiteness and they kind of explain how, what was really meant by it. But uh, even early church leaders were talking about the shade of the skin was going to become lighter as if having dark skin was the problem and so uh, yeah there's all kinds of things like that that could be problematic and, and I look at it look I'm active I'm an active LDS guy I'm not going to apologize I, I there's been times in my life that I wasn't that I've not been in good standing with the church but I'm in good standing with the church now and and uh, I go to church but Man, it just makes me shake my head sometimes with some of the things that come out of our leaders. And I spoke at a conference at Utah State University about inclusion and diversity. And a young woman came up to me after and she said she left the church a few years ago. And she was crying and said, she, she asked me, I don't know how you do it, how you can stay. And I just said, look, <laughs> the only way I can stay is I believe in the pure gospel doctrine of Christ. That's what I believe in. And I believe the church is being run by imperfect people that screw it up all the time and are slow to apologize and are slow to make change. And, and as long as you keep that in mind and, and focus on the doctrine and focus on being good to people, focus on the two commandments, the first two, and that's it. Don't do anything else. You'll get it right, and that's what you can do. That's how I navigate it. Because otherwise, I'd lose my mind. So, We have another question online from Alicia Hall, who is amazing. Hi, Alicia. She says, the Book of Mormon is a how to not deal with racism and colorism. <laughs> with the current racial tensions and racism against people of color, what can we learn to do to avoid the same theoretical outcome? Oh. <laughs> She's always asking the smart question. Yeah, what can we do? I mean the million dollar question right so uh, do what my grandmother said she said our communities are only as strong as the most vulnerable so if you keep that in mind and, and, and that's how natives looked at things you always took care of each other and especially the most vulnerable and the most vulnerable in our communities today are usually people of color and, and so uh, making sure that all of our policies and within our governments and all of the things as we can do as neighbors to reach out to people and make a difference in our communities, just making sure that that most vulnerable, those most vulnerable people uh, have a voice and have a seat at the table. And, and the policies that we enact uh, with our governments are friendly to them and actually help them. And so th that's the only way we're going to get there. And I don't know if we're ever going to get there. That's why I ran for Congress. I just wanted to, I didn't, I, I knew I wasn't going to win, but I wanted to make sure that people knew we need to do it differently. We need to treat people differently and what that could look like and what government could look like and what the voice should look like. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to make a difference, but we'll see. Do we have time for another question? We're, we're, we're good? Overtime. We're over time? Okay, well, we are over time, and that is my fault. <laughs> uh, okay, well, Darren, thank you so much. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask them in the app, and will you? Yeah, I'll stick them? around too. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, and I would just encourage everyone to go buy the book, The Bear River Massacre, Shoshone History. Um, go purchase it online if, if you haven't gotten it. And you're going to sign some copies. Yeah, I think there's some outside too. Okay. So. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. Thank you.